So, Dave, you're looking almost another year uh, wiser. Certainly oh, another Brad. year better. Almost another year wiser. It's my birthday, my friend. <laughs> it is. Happy oh, birthday. Heaven sent its sweetest angel, and I've, I've, I, it's my birthday, <laughs> little baby angel's birthday. Now, I, I got to know, what do you do to celebrate your birthday? I, I'm, I'm picturing the, the Kellett's uh, family with, with hats and a big cake and, 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 and family all around. Well, maybe not these days, family all around, but uh, how do you generally uh, celebrate your birthday? So that's a good question, actually, because uh, I'm a unique type of personality in that I could give less of a shit about my birthday. I yeah. never cared about my birthday party. I never walked around going, I'm a little prince. Everybody <laughs> needs to be nice to me on my birthday. I'm a little prince. Uh, I think it's because the, I'm the youngest of seven. And so it was always like, here's your sheet cake. And, you yeah. know, that was. Uh, and don't get precious about yeah, it. Don't get, yeah, exactly. There's 19 others of you having a birthday this month. Um, so I. Other people in my life love their birthdays. It's like, now it's my birthday week. It's my birthday month. Birthday you know, they stretch week. it out. Oh yeah. my God. Have you, ever, have you never encountered someone that does that? No. Oh, it's my birthday no, week. Thank, Come on. <laughs> thank goodness. Thank goodness my <laughs> wife is very down to earth. And I'm not saying that that uh, your wife is. <laughs> is <it less? laughs> but my wife is like, like you. She's like, I don't care. It's my birthday. Big deal. Yeah. I. Uh, if anything, I want. I, I think what it is is. And I'm, maybe part of this is why I'm a, a quiet, introspective person for the most mm -hmm. part. I don't like attention aimed at me, if yeah. that makes sense. Like when we hold these huge game nights at yeah. um, at our house where it's like 40, 50 people. Oh, God, I miss them, by the way. Um, we hold these huge game nights, and uh, we always do one on my birthday. And everyone wants to make that game night about me. And I'm always like, no, I... I want this to be about the game. You're giving me a birthday gift if you have fun on this game night. That's yes, what I want, yes. you know? Has it always been that way? Even young Dave Kellett, like 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 8 or 12 years old, was like, nah, it's just another day? No, I think, oddly enough, I think it started to change around college, where I was just like, I don't I don't care. I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want everybody. Yeah. All, it, it's so funny, too, because after COVID, one of the things that you wonder, like, will this ever come back, is the idea of blowing all of your spit onto a cake before everybody eats it. Yeah. Who's going to you know, do like, that anymore? All right, who wants some of my spit on their cake? Here we go. <laughs> you know, you wait. Some smart entrepreneur is going to come up with a solution to that problem, like a like a cake cover that has candles built into it or something, <laughs> and they're going to they're going to make a mint. Somebody's going to solve that problem and or they're going to make have a it mint. Where, you're going to have it where because uh, I can see me doing this for my kids. You bake a cake, but then you also do a little separate cupcake that also yep. just has the candle on it. The and then that's just for them. cake. Yep. The one that got me laughing the other day, though, was the internet. The idea that, like, well, bowling is dead. No one is ever going to bowl again. Because the idea of putting your fingers into a ball and then eating nachos right next to it as you're, like, that. <laughs> After COVID, none of us are ever walking into a bowling alley again. The shoes, the whole thing is just like, hey, how do you feel about bacteria? You want some? Let me tell you a little something about Bad Axe, Michigan. Okay. I, I'm on the phone with my dad, and this was during the beginning of the outbreak. And 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 the governor had shut things down. <clears throat> and I said, well, because my dad and a lot of my brothers are big-time bowlers. And my dad's like, we're out. Mom's like, uh, mom quit her league. And uh, But I found out that the guy that ran the bowling alley was uh, you know, told by the state to shut down, started running underground bowling. <laughs> like the 1920s. Like, like it's a, a speakeasy, speakeasy for bowling. You it's had a to speakeasy for bowling. You had to park around back. You had to come in secretly. He was had all the lights in the front off. He, had, he was running under, and of course, a bunch of people, including members of my family, were showing up for bowling night <laughs> with God. no masks, no nothing, just oh, bowling God. away. No, I don't. I think bowling might be dead in Los Angeles. In Bad X, Michigan, bowling it never took a hit and is thriving. <laughs> oh my God, Bad X! I love that they turned the bowling alley into a speakeasy. Yeah. You have to knock. And then you have to be like, what's the password? Oh, 23 is canoe. All right, come on in and you can bowl illegally during yeah. COVID. Jeez Louise. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you know, no governor is going to tell us what and to do. And the world wonders why America is having this trouble. It's like we can't even stop bowling. You can't just, 
<laughs> okay, it's going to be, it's not like it's the year without a Santa Claus. It's a year without bowling league. Just one year. Just hang out for a little bit, you know? I love that image of Bad X that there's so little things to do. Oh my God. That if you shut down the bowling alley, it's like a heroin addict scratching at their arms. It's yeah. like, gotta get to, get to the bowling alley. Gotta, no, oh, gotta throw a strike. No. Yeah. I, I, please, please find me a place I can wear rented shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god and on that note i'm gonna say hello everybody and welcome to comic lab the show about rented shoes and <laughs> making comics and making a living from comics I, I i'm gonna find out right now whether anybody from my family listens to this show <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm brad geiger editor of webcomics.com and the cartoonist of evil inc you're gonna get a facebook post that says like brad the sheriff visited us because of you yeah, darn you yeah and I'm his friend Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave, let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. I'm excited to say we've got a good show uh, oh, for today. Yeah. And Bradley J. Geiger, what do we got for the first topic, my friend? First topic, right out of the chute here, we've got a good one. It says, hey, Dave and Brad, you two do an excellent job of offering helpful feedback and advice, even when it isn't what the recipient wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it made me curious. Is there any advice that either of you received during your career that you didn't want to hear, but looking back, you're grateful you listened to him? Thanks for making us eat our vegetables, j -Lark. So, Dave, what's the hardest advice you're ever happy you got? Well... I got to say, it's uh, I so I read Jay's question a little bit differently, which mm -hmm. was not necessarily the hardest advice that you you uh, you're grateful to have listened to. I I read it more. I know that's the way he angled it. I read it more as the the advice that I got that I didn't want to listen to well, and ended up not listening to. That's valid too. That's valid too because we're doing. It's the overall topic of getting advice you don't want to hear. Right. So the advice that I got that I'm so glad I listened to was. Frankly, tuning into forums around 1998, 99, 2000, mm. and seeing that, like, well, no, you don't have to go to print. You can just do what you want to do on the web. Yeah. And for me, that was groundbreakingly uh, 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 eye-opening that you could be like, well, no, don't do print. Keep in mind, everybody, that for, you know, 20 years, I had been angling to try to get into print. Mm -hmm. And so to switch gears on that, I was so happy for people like uh, Scott Kurtz and Rich Stevens and people that had said, no, you don't have to go this way. You can go that way. Yeah. So that's one that I was really grateful for that I didn't want to hear at first. I was like, yeah. no, no, you guys are, I, I'll try it, but you guys don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, syndication uh, is still uh, the way to go. Uh, yeah. Uh, another one is more recent. Our buddy over at uh, BuzzFeed, Kevin McShane, yeah. the the good the big poobah over at uh, BuzzFeed, has been on my case for years, being like, David, you've got to produce a mobile friendly website. You cannot use this <laughs> rickety old. And he's right. He yeah. is a thousand percent right. I just haven't done it yet. Yeah. But Kevin, you are right. It's good advice. I am just slow on the move on this one, but I, it is good advice that I need to take. But now, Brad, how about you? Advice oh. that you got that you're either grateful that it, even though it was painful or mm -hmm. that you didn't take. Or didn't take. Well, I've got one of each, actually. Okay. Uh, the one that I'm grateful that I, that I took, uh, I remember sitting at uh, uh, Comic-Con International in San Diego. What year? And, Oh, golly. It was, it had to have been back during, well, I don't know. You know what? I don't know exactly what Good year. Good story so far. All right. We've got all the details lined up. We're ready to jump right <laughs> into it. <laughs> Never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, no, it, it was, uh, I, I, because I think it was post Greystone Inn. I had started Evil Inc., but at, at any rate, so it doesn't 2000s, really matter. early 2000s, basically. Yeah. yeah. All right. And I was sitting down with Robert Koo, who was the business manager for Penny Arcade. And mm -hmm. Penny Arcade at that point was the biggest success ever in web comics. I, I mean, I don't know that anybody gets uh, uh, higher than what they were at that point. They were they were the 800-pound gorilla in web well, comics. Well, you know what? In terms of staff, I think they are – if staff is an indicator of overall gross income for a corporation, mm -hmm. Penny Arcade might still be the most successful Might still one. be, Yeah. Like Matt Inman makes a fair chunk, uh, but I, most of that is with the gaming side of the oatmeal and not the oatmeal, you know? Mm hmm. 
Like, yeah, I'm trying to think might. who else would make more. I think they'd still they'd still probably qualify to be the most successful. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, argue that. But I was sitting down with uh, with Robert Koo and 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 you know as you do you get talking and I said of course the a number one great lament of every web cartoonist and every creator uh, creative individual out there ever. And that is, Robert, I just feel like if I could just get some more people to look at my comic, they would like it and I would I would have a bigger audience. I just need to figure out how to how to get those people to look. If I had more eyeballs on my comic, I could I could achieve success. Yeah. And uh, and and, and I, if you've ever talked to Robert, you know, he's very, very direct. And uh, he said uh, he said. You have exactly the audience you deserve. And just laid it out there. Just boom. No, no, no warming touch, no salve on the wound. He said, you have exactly the audience you deserve. You have exactly the audience you deserve. That is both truthful and painful to hear, yeah. no matter what stage you're at. And so I'm sure I've, you know, I spit and sputtered, you know, a picture Donald Duck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, jumping Wait, up and so down. Suddenly, you don't have pants on at Comic Con. Is that what we're imagining? <laughs> never pants, never pants at Comic Con. Uh, but I, uh, but I, I I'm, I'm sure I sputtered about it a bit. And he, and he said, "Here's the thing: you have the comic that you've earned doing your. You, you have the readership that you've earned doing your comic. Mm -hmm. if, if I could send a whole bunch of uh, readers to you, but unless that comic improves in a certain way." You're never going to keep them. And he says, you already know that's true back from the Keen Spot days when you would be in the Keen Spot spotlight, right? And for one day, your site got inundated with all kinds of new readers. And then three days later, most of gone. them are gone. Yeah, gone. You know this from if you've ever run any advertising you know, mm -hmm. or, or like doing Project Wonderful. Or ever got a huge link from some big person online, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Yes, yeah. you get inundated with a torrent of new readers, and if the comic isn't good, you lose them all in a couple of days. Well, and the flip side of that is also true, Brad, yeah. in terms of why we don't like or recommend advertising, because... Mm -hmm. Sure, you can spend a hundred bucks a day, a thousand bucks a day advertising on Google or Facebook or whatever or Twitter, but as soon as those uh, that spigot of ad dollars turns off, yep, those readers turn off, yep. and you will find a surprisingly low number of people that that came in that original wave stuck around, right? Yeah, yeah, and though and, 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 and absolutely, and so I had to sit with that for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> it really, I really took me back. Uh, uh, but when I came through it, when I, when I, uh, you know, kind of argued it out in my mind, uh, it, 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 that's how I finally got to this point where I said, listen, it's all about the comic. That's why I say all the time on the show, do a good comic. Yeah. That's when I stopped looking outward for excuses. It's because I don't have enough eyeballs. I don't have, you know, the magic hashtag SEO, all this other stuff. And and once I started uh, uh, to look inward for the answer, in other words, how can I make this comic better? What where is this comic failing? Where is mm -hmm. it? Where is it faltering? What do I need to do better? Once I started concentrating on that, the audience followed. But unless he would have smacked me across the face and said, you know, in, in that very simple way, you've got exactly. The, and, and he said, and by the way, I should say he didn't say just me. He says. He, he, he went on to say every web cartoonist has exactly the audience they deserve. Well, it's, can I correct you? Because I was yeah. actually standing next to you when this happened. And he didn't he didn't generalize. He said specifically, Brad, you've got what you deserve. You, you, and you should be you, happy with it. You should be so happy with the audience you have. No, You're no, he's lucky. right. No, there, it's right. Because uh, at this point, too, the younger me would have been like, oh, if I could just mm. get my comic in front of more people, then I would really, then the world would see I'm great. Yep. Right? Like, that's yep. a version of, then they'll see how fantastic I am. At this point now, 21 years of Sheldon peering online, maybe 22 years, no, 22 years now, geez Louise, 22 years of Sheldon online, I've probably been seen by one, two million people, yep. and I ended up with the audience that I deserved. Yep. And as painful as that is, uh, that's what I got. I got one-tenth of one-tenth of one-tenth percent of, mm -hmm. of that, you know, and that's fine. I've built a career on that. Yes, but that's the important are, thing. 
Those are the people that stuck around. Yeah. Yeah. And part so, of, part of the, so a lot of these I'll tie into each other. One of the reasons why we say the 10,000 hours is that uh, you do absolutely the, the 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 flip side of this is also true for Robert's point. You do absolutely need to be seen by more people. Mm-hmm. But it's also that uh, a recognition that a remarkably small number of those people will stick around. Mm-hmm. And so you can only reach X number of people by doing those 10,000 hours and keeping the work out there, keeping it consistent, keeping it a, 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 um, a very uh, a delightful ending, whether it be a punchline or, mm-hmm. a, a, you know, satisfactory ending for each update. Um, uh, and so all of our advice still plays true, even though Robert's advice is true. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, like I said, it was, it was tough to take, but man, I'm glad I listened to it because uh, it it brought me around on a whole different philosophy. That's, that's really the day I stopped, uh, uh, looking for, uh, an SEO trick. It's, it's when I stopped looking for all that stuff and really started to pay more attention to what I was doing. Uh, so you said you had two. What was your second uh, moment of strong advice? Uh, the first, well, I think I, I'd mentioned both of them. The um, going online uh, was the big one, and, and away from print, which was a fantastic oh, okay. one. And then Kevin McShane with the website. I will oh, say too, right. there was one that I did not want to hear early on in my comics, um, and it took me a while to realize that the world was right in the feedback I was getting, which was, "Hey, I like your comics." Your writing is is pretty good. Your comics are pretty good. Your eyes are really weird. I don't know what you're doing with it. Because remember, we've talked about this in the past, about how a lot of artists, ourselves included, have that, like, I'm being me. I'm developing yes. my style. And yes. so I'm going to have weird eyeballs. Yep. Well, for, for the world was telling me and editors were telling me, like, hey, you, you've got potential here. Mm-hmm. These eyes are weird. You've got to change this. This yeah. is not working, you know. And that was hard for me to hear. 20-year-old me, 22-year-old me did not want to hear that the thing that I thought was making me unique yeah. was not, in fact, making me... Oh, you know what? I'll say... Chris Straub actually had one comment one time that I didn't want to hear, and he was right. I think it was Chris Straub. I used to do my lettering all uppercase, as we recommend, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I did my lettering all uppercase, but I would make the first letter of every word about a third taller. Oh, yes. Do you remember when I did this? I remember that. And... Uh, I believe it was Chris Straub was like, this is not working visually. You want the flow to be like easy on the eyes and yeah. you're making it harder on the eyes. This is neither sentence case, nor is it title case. It's it's title case plus sentence case, which yep. is weird, you yep. know? And so uh, I didn't also did not want to hear that advice at the time, but it was good. It was like my eyeballs. I thought I was being unique. Yep. In fact, I was just making it harder for the reader. You were just making it harder. I, 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 the other piece of advice that I got that is is a great story uh, goes all the way back to when I was working at the Akron Beacon Journal on the deadline shift, and it was me and this other guy. Uh, By the way, does anything sound more like a classic newspaper name from back in the day than the Akron Beacon Journal? It's got such great iambic Akron pentameter. Beacon Akron, Beacon Beacon Akron Beacon Journal. Akron Beacon Journal. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I back in the day, I was working uh, the deadline shift, and the and the other guy, uh, Dennis, was really really into comics as well, and uh, and so he was really interested in what I was uh, doing. I was putting at that point it was uh, it was in the nineties, so I hadn't gone online yet, and I was working on uh, Greystone Inn as a syndicate submission, and he goes uh, and he's looking at it, and he's looking at Argus, and he says, "What is this character?" It is, it, it, and I said, it's a, it's a gargoyle. Again, Dave, trying to stand out, right? right. Nobody was doing not a gargoyles. Dog, not a cat. It's a gargoyle. Exactly. And he says, it's really hard to tell what this is. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's a gargoyle. They, they call him a gargoyle. You'll get it. Yeah. You, you know, after you read the first, first couple of strips, you know, you getting into it, you'll, you'll understand he's a gargoyle. And, and he's like, why, a, why a gargoyle? People can't really relate to gargoyles. And I'm like, because nobody's doing gargoyles. I'm not going to, exactly what you said, Dave, was ex- what I told him. I'm not going to do a talking dog or a talking cat. Right, That's not right. original. That's not enough for my creative genius, right? <laughs> a talking dog. And uh, and he says, hey, you know, you, people are going to, and, and I, he says, what about this? It's a comic strip inside of a comic strip. It's, 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 they're self-referential, but they're not. And, and and I said, yeah, like if you remember, Dave, back in the back at the time, I was really, really inspired by the Larry Sanders show. Did you ever yes. watch that? Yes. Gary Shandling? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, it's like it's like the Larry Sanders show. It's it's a comic strip. It's behind the scenes, but they film a comic like a like a TV show. And he says that's really difficult is for a daily comic to get into that conceit. It's really difficult to right, right. make that come across to an audience. And I said, but yeah, you'll get it. You'll get it. You read a few, you'll get it. And uh, and he he just looked at me and he looked down at the s- submission, looked back up at me, kind of wrinkled, wrinkled up his face and said, well, enjoy obscurity. Oh. <laughs> And I know that story, and it still always stings oh, whenever I hear it. Oh, but God. he was he was in so, joy of security. He huh? was so right because he was like, "Well, it, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not going to convince you." Everything he said right. to me, I had some smart ass answer for. I knew everything. I knew the world. You know, I when when in truth, I knew nothing. Uh, and and he was trying to give me really good advice. And what he said, he meant from. He didn't mean it. I I know him very very well. He didn't mean it in a mean way. What he meant was, yeah. you are going to be obscure if you do this. So find something to enjoy about it. You know, you're you're going to have a very, very small number of people who follow this. You better find something to enjoy about that world or else you're going to be disappointed because this thing is never going to bring you to where you want to go. Right. You know, another version of that is um, we've had a couple friends over the course of our career uh, Brad, that other cartoonists mm-hmm. who draw a comic strip that is a reversion of a reversion of a reversion of the comic strip that they came up with in fourth grade. Yes. And and no matter what we tell them, like, you have more ideas, you have better ideas. Yes. Don't, don't, you're not wedded to this just because it's the thing you've been doing for a decade. You can walk away and start something better and they can't do it. And it's a version of like, uh, you know, enjoy obscurity because they have they have committed so hard in their own mind that this is my idea, this is my winning idea. People are gonna get it. They're gonna yes. like it. I just gotta keep at it. And it's like, no. At some point, you can say, "I'm more creative than this idea that I had in fourth grade." I can step away from this and do something different. No, I think you're absolutely right, and I think you have to. I think again, we come from this syndicate mentality where you're supposed to do the same thing for 10, 20 years, yes. and it's okay to say, "I'm done with this now. I'm gonna start a new." thing and put all my steam behind it. In fact, it's the only way you're going to grow as a creator. Let me ask you, because I don't know that yeah. we've ever talked about this. I now see a day where Drive is finished mm-hmm. and I see a day where Sheldon is finished and yeah. I don't know what the replacement projects are, but I know that there'll be something. Do you see a day now where Evil Inc. is finished? Oh yeah, without a doubt. It it, 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 it probably, uh, or, or at least morphs into something else, probably uh, at this point, once uh, Captain Heroic and Miss Match finally get together in a in a union and have their first couple of years of married life, uh, I, I don't want to go back to the idea of them having kids because that was really not great for the storytelling. But but at some point when they finally get together, it's gonna it's gonna be the beginning of the end of of that uh, entire series. And there's lots of other things to do. I've got, yeah. the, the, the great thing about this is that having done so many different projects now, I've got probably three or four good ideas for what I'd like to do next. All right. Well, that's, I don't know that I ever asked you that before. So thank you for that. All right, well, let us jump into the next question. So this one comes in and says, Hey, Brad and Dave, I wanted to send this message because, one, I wanted to remind you that you were both awesome and uplifting. Hey, hey, that's fantastic. That's a nice thing for my birthday. I'm a little prince. It's my birthday, Brad. Just a reminder, I'm a little prince. Um, uh, Number two, I wanted to ask my question. You often talk about, quote, drawing away from something you like. I definitely have certain comics that I like in regards to style and drawing. Mm -hmm. As I am developing my own style, I do not want to copy someone else's work, but feel like working on a similar style. Can you explain drawing away from something again? Have you done this or known others that did it successfully? Thanks a bunch, gents. So, Brad, a question for you. You love a style. uh, Let's just say it's Garfield or something. You love Garfield. Mm -hmm. You want to draw in that family of Garfield. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And you want to learn what you can from copying Davis's style, but you want it to be your own. You don't want someone to read it and go, well, this is just Garfield, but now it's a superhero and, you know, he's Captain Heroic, but it's drawn like Garfield. So uh, what uh, how do you do that? How do you approach that? Like if you're uh, uh, starting off in in cartooning, how do you copy a style? How do you appreciate a style? How do you incorporate a style without 
mimicking the style so that it is uniquely your own. You've learned from it. Yeah. But you've moved away from it. How do you do that? So when I was a little kid, I used to talk about, uh, you know, life with my uh, with my mom. And I would say, you know, this whole idea of, of, of meeting a girl and falling in love and getting married. Uh, how am I going to know that it's the right person? How do I know that I'm in love? How do I know that, that this person's good for a relationship? And she says, I, I don't know. You just you just know you, when the time is right, when the feeling is right, when the relationship is right. It feels different and you'll just, you'll just know. And uh, I always thought that was such a bullshit answer. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> oh God, you got me. <sighs> Until I met Carolyn. Oh, there we go. And then I, and then I got it. And, and so I'm going to give this question asker a complete bullshit answer that until he gets to that same point or in, she we don't know oh, by the that, way that's true that's true until they get into that right point in their life they'll see that i that i knew what i was talking about and here's what i'm going to tell you we all start out by mimicking people that we like for me it was it wasn't uh, uh, uh garfield it was bloom county i wanted to very much draw like that right yeah uh, yeah. And so we all started out mimicking these uh, creators that we that we liked. Uh, what happens is when you do something over and over and over and over again, like a mm -hmm. hundred times, five hundred times, ten thousand times, every time you're drawing, I don't know whether this is you, Dave, or or whether it's uh, uh, me or you or just all of us. Uh, but when I'm drawing, I'm talking to myself, like. That nose looks right. That's a little bit wrong. That's a little crooked. Let's fix that. You know, I'm, I've got a constant uh, uh, monologue going on in my head, uh, which is why a lot of times when I'm drawing, I, I after I'm penciling, I'd like to turn something on for music or background because after a while, as you know from doing this show, I get very annoying. <laughs> but I'm always trying to, you know, like, is that nose, is there another way to do that? You know, is, is, what if I put a shadow down there? And then, of course, also there's that, and then there's a hundred thousand happy accidents where your that's pen... right. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you said that's yeah. where I was going to go. Happy accidents. Yeah. Yes. Where your pen just does something weird. It's like, oh my god, that's perfect. That's I, I never would have thought to do that. that. That's better. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so, what's going to happen is after you're drawing for a long, long time, you start out like probably all of us did. Start out mimicking things that you think is great. Uh, but when you do it enough, your own sensibility, your own sense of aesthetic that you also gain by those two things that I said, plus going out into the world and looking at more art that you like, going out and finding other artists that that turn you on, finding other cartoonists that are working in ways that uh, that you think is awesome by exposing yourself over and over and over again to other people's work that is exciting to you. By doing those three things, eventually you look back, like we said before, in the rearview mirror and you say, oh, my gosh, I don't know how it happened, but I've got a drawing style. And here right. it is, you know. Uh, right. So I think that's I, I, I can't give you a good answer other than to keep drawing and keep drawing and to keep asking yourself, is this what I and, and I know this sounds dumb, Dave. I keep asking myself, is this what I think is beautiful? Is, is, did I find beauty in this panel, right? Uh, did I find beauty? Is this what I think? Because I, after a little while, I've got a certain way that I like to draw a nose. I got a certain way that I like to draw a certain character. I've got a certain way that I like to draw a certain gesture. It's because I think that's beautiful. And I finally found beauty and I'm going to continue to... Uh, expand and enhance what that concept is for me. And the only way you can do that is by drawing over and over and over again. Right? Yeah, I think, yes, I think the answer is more drawing and that is such, that sounds so unsatisfying, yes. but like, let's, I'm going to stick with the Garfield. Let's mm -hmm. say I really love Jim Davis. And I yeah. did yeah. Uh, third grade, Dave Kelly. My God, there was nobody I wanted to draw more than like Jim Davis. Right. Uh, so I I would trace Garfield. I mm -hmm. would copy Garfield. I would look at how Garfield would do different poses and figure out like, hey, how did his arm go up here? And what were the physics of of the the Garfield walk cycle and this and yeah. that? And I was trying to figure it out, right? 
Uh, but here's the thing. As you draw, I would look at Garfield less and less, right? So what yes. happens is whatever lessons I learned from Garfield, it morphs in drawing one. Mm-hmm. Drawing two, it's a little even bore, a bit even more morphed. Yeah. Drawing three looks even more changed. Drawing mm-hmm. four is kind of remarkably different. Drawing five is very different now. Drawing six starts to look like my style. And in the meantime, all those happy accidents, all those pen slips that Brad was mentioning, mm-hmm. those start to get incorporated. In the meantime, I start to get my own opinions on how Garfield yes. was doing it wrong, actually. And that maybe <laughs> it should be more like this instead of like that. And all that stuff starts to happen. So you do 100 hours of drawing, it changes a little bit. You do 500 hours of drawing, changes even more. 1,000 hours of drawing, now you're starting to get a real style going. Yeah. You know, 2000, And what I'm saying is that really it's the application of pen on paper, pencil on paper, again and again and again and again and again, that your style starts to move away from the source material and starts to, frankly, develop into something that is uniquely your own. And um, unfortunately, because of copyright in the 20th century, we got this idea that starting from a copying position Mm -hmm. was wrong, that that somehow was childish, that that somehow was what only a thief would do. But the truth is that all of us as artists have to learn from the people that came before. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way that like Shakespeare basically lifted Boccaccio's Decameron, uh, artists will take uh, from other artists and they'll incorporate it into the style. The trick is to incorporate it, to not copy it. You you copy it in the first couple hundred hours of you trying to figure out how they did it. But then on hour 500, you're like, no, I can actually make it better or make it my own or make it unique. And that is the application of time and practice onto copying don't you think brad yeah it's like in movies where the person always it gets into a situation and they go you know what would my idol do in this situation yes right? yeah, yeah and yeah. they go they go what would dick tracy do in a situation like this that's what it's like being an, an, an artist at first you go how would jim davis draw this scene and then you look at it and say hey this is good because this is how jim davis would have drew that scene then when your aesthetic develops, you start to say, how would Brad Geiger draw that scene? And mm-hmm, then it's good mm-hmm. because that's exactly how Brad Geiger would draw that scene. And the truth is, none of us have one source material that we want to copy, no. right? So, for example, young Dave Kellett I loved Garfield, right? Third grade. Gar- but also then a little bit of Calvin and Hobbes started to leak yeah. in. And then a little bit of Bloom County and then a little bit of Farside and then a little bit of Foxtrot and a little bit of this. And what I'm saying is... All these sources, you're like, I like the way they do this. I like the way that they approach the body in this way. I like how they Mm -hmm. structure their eyes or their face in this. And you start to incorporate all these bits and bops and pieces. And again, with the application of time and practice and repetition, those bits and bots from all these different sources filter into what becomes your style. Yeah. And now it's... Oh, like like Brad always says, though, it's it's easy to see in the rearview mirror. It's hard for us to project for you Mm -hmm. what your style will become. But the idea is just continuous drawing and practice and having fun and basically allowing yourself to explore and make mistakes and try new things and go down dead end paths and then start back again in a different way. That will all happen. But that's what the hundreds of hours and thousands of hours of drawing are for. Yeah. And that's although it's uh, out of the three major headlines of advice, we, we didn't spend as much time on it. But what you said about exposing yourself to other people's work is really important. I can't I I can't uh, suggest it strongly enough. In other words, load up your social media with other cartoonists. Read read a lot. Yes, because number one, it's going to keep all that negative stuff out of uh, that's always on social media. It'll make that stuff harder to get through, right? If you're loaded up with these cartoonists doing work that you think is beautiful. And it's also as you're as you're scrolling through, I guarantee you're going to stop and go, oh, my gosh. How how did she draw that nose? Yeah. Or look yeah. at how look at the angle this or look at the line work on the that. shading on this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Look at that. That's a that's an idea I would have never thought to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and then you put that into your mental file for I'm going to try that someday. And honestly, the more broadly you read, yeah. don't just read North American comics. Dive into dive into uh, manga uh, oh. manga dive dive into French bande dessinée. 
and uh, get them all. I just love saying bon dissene, bon dissene. Um, but uh, try European comics, you know, the sort of album style comics. Try manga in, in, in love. what I mean by try it is not only read it, but like doodle it, you know, see what you see, how, what yeah. you can incorporate from from, say, a Mobius or from uh, uh, somebody that you don't normally uh, grew up with, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, you'll find that little trickles of what they did. You might not be able to recreate it for one thing, but just trying it, you'll learn a little bit about how they did it and why they did it. And it will it will trickle into your work. Absolutely. And, and it, it, here's a great example, because I've been really with, along with my kids, I've been doing a lot of deep diving on manga and anime. And uh, and man, I can't tell you how just reading superhero manga has made me rethink some of the superhero things I do. Mm -hmm. But even here's a great example. And just in terms of exposing yourself to other comics more broadly, like you're saying, Dave, if, if in American comics, if you draw somebody going fast, like the flash, you draw the foreground character with his arms all blurred. Right. Or you draw six little flashes going across the screen. Right. Right. Or right. you find you, you draw lots of lines around that character to indicate that that character is in motion. The character's in motion. Uh, and the background is drawn as a background to show that he's going across that background. If you look at manga, they draw the character solid and they blur the background. Yes. Right? Yeah. So now yeah. you've got that character really in a stationary place, but you can see all the details on that character. It's the background that's in motion. By yeah. the way, both are true. <laughs> right? Both are true when you're talking about true physical motion. But in, in manga, they tend to emphasize the background uh, to show that that motion and being able to do both of those well automatically makes you a powerhouse in terms of what your visual uh, library is. Mm -hmm. And you'd never know mm -hmm. that unless you saw other people's approaches to comics. Yeah, what, you know, we don't talk about it much either, but uh, I love how the iconography of manga is so mm -hmm. markedly different, yeah. having developed for 30, 40 years separately from from Western comics. I mean, now there's a, sort of an interplay, but the uh, the idea of the single uh, sweat drop down the side of the face yes. or the exhaled ghost or the, the slashes under the eyes that yep. manga has, all of that is so unique and frankly is really instructive for a cartoonist that you don't have to be so wedded to um, the Canadian, U.S., Australian idea of what the iconography of comics is. You can create your own. That's part of the language of comics that you can start to fiddle with, you know? Yeah. And it's just sort of fun to see. So the, the question, though, that I think everybody, Brad, wants us to circle back around on, and we almost left it on the table without discussing it, oh. is... You had mentioned working for the Akron Beacon Journal. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, uh, because I know that everyone wants to know, what yes. was it like to live in Akron? Oh, Because I, to me, I, is Akron, I've never been there. I've been near it, but I've never been to Akron. Is Akron one of those towns that's like, we've got two or maybe four skyscrapers? Yeah. And, it's like, and it's, there's a lot of meatpacking plants and somewhat just outside of town. Like, yeah. what is... It's a little big city. You know, they've got a couple of skyscrapers uh, and stuff in the in the city. And, of course, it's very close to Cleveland. So Cleveland is kind of where everybody... Where, where Cleveland becomes the big city. Yes. I'm going into Cleveland. Yes. Oh, that's where you want, <laughs> If you wanted to have a, a good time out, uh, you know, that's where all the nightclubs were. That's where all the I've bars were. I washed my socks. I'm going into <laughs> Cleveland. Yes. My white socks from the, <laughs> uh, from the Parma White Sox factory, which is a reference nobody gets. But... Uh, Akron was, as you know, probably that's where uh, uh, Firestone and Goodyear. There was a bunch of rubber manufacturing. That's where all the tires rolled out of was Akron, Ohio. Yeah, that's where uh, uh, Ford's what was it, uh, brother-in-law went down into Akron, right, to yeah. develop uh, the rubber plants. Yeah, and uh, and of course, the, you know, we saw the Goodyear blimp on a uh, on a regular basis. I went up yeah, yeah, in the yeah. Goodyear blimp. As a how many of fact. how many years were you in Akron? Yeah, very short. I was there, I think, for a year and a half to two years. And it's amazing because this just came up in conversation the other night. I only worked at the Beacon Journal for uh, like maybe a year and a half to two years. Three nights ago, I had a stress dream about walking into the Beacon Journal and, you know, somebody had torn down my computer and my uh, work desk and I had to do all this stuff, but I couldn't do it. Uh, for, for a place that I only worked two years, I still have stress dreams about it. 
Isn't that interesting? I uh, will occasionally, and I was only at the San Diego Union Tribune, which was the paper, the bigger paper in San Diego. Mm-hmm. I was there for about a year and a half, about the same amount of time that you yeah. were in the Akron Beacon Journal. But it's funny how it looms large in my memory as well. And I think it was the pressures of a newsroom or just like, your heart is a little faster as you're trying to get things to deadline and this and that. There's a lot of running around in a newsroom. Yep. Uh, I'm so glad I don't have that anymore as a cartoonist. No, me either. I'm very happy to have left that behind. <laughs> hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, now that we've hit the hard-hitting uh, Akron uh, Beacon Journal update uh, for everyone, <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad we we dived into Akron. Uh, I wanted to update everybody on Amazon Advantage. Uh, mm. I've been having um, a lot of thoughts lately about Amazon and about the changing world coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a lot of cartoonists, myself included, have benefited from comparatively wonderful shipping rates in the U.S. postal system for the last 20 years, with, mm-hmm. especially with media mail for books. You can take a very heavy, dense object, like a 200-pound book, and send it for $3 anywhere in the U.S. You know, yes. you can send it to Alaska, Florida, Hawaii, <laughs> Maine, $3.50. It's, ama- it's an amazing price point, so it makes mm-hmm. shipping very affordable. Um, but I, I, I think that the economics of the Postal Service, unfortunately, under our current Postal Master General, who's an idiot, um, mm-hmm. they are actively trying to strip it for parts and to make privatize more of the Postal Service. And yeah. it, unfortunately, has been one of the gems that all Americans can agree on has been a wonderful success story for America as our Postal Service. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit falling apart. In the same time, coming out of the pandemic, we're kind of getting a consolidation of retail around three, four, maybe five major online retailers. Yeah. Most of which falls to the top two. But anyway, you're kind of seeing Walmart, Sam's Club. You're seeing Amazon. You're seeing Target. You're seeing a few other major ones, right? And all the traditional ones that we grew up with, the Sears, the Kmarts, the JCPenney's, <laughs> the Macy's, they're all really struggling as they don't know what to do with this massive real estate holdings that they have that no mm-hmm. one wants to go to. Anyway, what I'm getting at is I have been for a while now keeping a toe in the Amazon world by using Amazon Advantage because mm-hmm. both because of a concern for rising postal rates and also because a recognition that a captured credit card with one-click buying uh, can be a key factor in getting people to buy my books via Amazon. And also, the hope being that once I get into their system and have enough sales, the recommendation engine would start to benefit me, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, hey, if you like this, a lot of other people liked, uh, recommended, or bought Dave Kellett's Anatomy of Animals, for example, or something like that, right? Anyway... It's been a two-year process, and I think I've shared in the past that I have hated working with Amazon technologically. Yeah. They have a terrible user interface. On the front-facing consumer side, Amazon is amazing. They could mm-hmm. not have made it more easy to buy something on Amazon. They are literally the world's best at, at making it easy for you to buy something. Yes. On the supply side, Amazon oh. is the worst. Mm. Their interfaces were designed in 1995 by 10 socially inept engineers who have never talked to other human beings, and it's just the worst, right? Yeah. So I hate that part of it, but I just wanted to give an update to people that so far there's been a, a slow, very slow, mm-hmm. but noticeable growth in my sales on Amazon Advantage. And um, I think around Christmas time, it was like five, six, seven hundred bucks worth of sales on Amazon. Not going to not gonna pay the rent or, or anything ma- massive in the near future, but just enough where I'm like, I think this experiment is worth continuing for me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not necessarily recommending it for anyone, but it's sort of an update that I think uh, some of the conditions that we have been operating under, Brad, in terms of our shipping from our own stores and the nature where and how people shop online are going to be changing coming out of this pandemic. 
Yeah. And so for me, it's about keeping my head on a swivel and tr- keeping a toe in a world that I'm not necessarily comfortable in, but I think I might need to for my business. What are your thoughts on that, Brad? I think you're yeah, absolutely right. I think you're being very smart. And I will uh, co-sign the, uh, the the supply side uh, of Amazon really stinks. Their, their, uh, their interface, their website is not good. But uh, like Dave rightly points out, there's lots and lots of good things that uh, can can happen in terms of being on this platform. It's where everybody is shopping. It really is the central place, uh, mm-hmm. a, a, even even you know greater than Walmart, quite frankly, especially for online sales. And don't discount that Amazon Prime effect where people get free shipping. You yep. know, you can you can argue all you want whether it's really free shipping, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. The fact of the matter is, I know from personal experience, and I know a lot of other people who have said the same thing, I buy so many things that I wouldn't have bought otherwise because I'm like, nah, it's free shipping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and here's the little, here's a little caddy, uh, caddy, cor- caddy corner. Why was I going to say caddy, caddy corner? corner? Here's the, here's a little thing to piggyback onto that, yeah. which is that um, for me, it cost me anywhere between 35 to 70 bucks to send a book to say New Zealand or Australia, right? Mm-hmm. For a customer down there. But if they buy one of my two pound, three pound books on Amazon, the heavy ones, to ship it to Australia or New Zealand, it's like seven bucks, 13 bucks Australian right, dollars. And not right. that bad, you know, like not great. But for people that are used to paying a bunch to ship something from the U.S. to Australia, they're like, oh, this is not that bad. Yeah. So what I'm getting at is it's Amazon sort of underwrites that shipping cost, too. And so there are small advantages. Do I love Amazon as a company? No. Do I no. love how they treat their employees? No. Definitely Do I sort not. of recognize that they are the 800 pound gorilla in online sales? Yes. Mm-hmm. And that the world is changing after the pandemic? Yes. Yes. And so what I'm saying at is I'm just trying to keep a toe in the water. Mm -hmm. And I think it is working so far anyway. I think it's smart. And by doing Amazon Advantage, you are not a third party vendor. You know how sometimes you see this certain thing is available. Oh, and you can also get it in this little button from a third party vendor. When you're putting your stuff up through Amazon uh, 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 Advantage, uh, it's it's up there like any other product or item or merchandise that they sell. It's right. it's an official thing. It's it's qualifies for Prime, yep. uh, so on and so forth. So you're on a higher echelon there than you would be using somebody else or so, you know another way of getting your stuff up there. It's right. really it's really effective, and it's been it's been uh, a good money maker for me as well in terms of uh, the return on investment. Uh, because I spent, I don't know how long it takes you to package books up for them. It usually takes the better part of an hour to do my weekly uh, Amazon event, uh, Advantage uh, shipping swath. Yes, and this is part of my frustration with their process, is that not only to get your books into their system, not only to main, oh. maintain your presence in Amazon, mm-hmm. but also just to, to click all the different myriad buttons and possibilities that they say for how you're going to ship it to them, yeah. how, you, how fast you're going to fulfill it, how much does it weigh, what carry are you using? Hey, what's your star sign? Hey, what's your favorite type of pasta? You have to tell Amazon a 9,000 different things because they're frankly processing billions of packages. So they right. just want to know in an automated way what to expect, when to expect it, how heavy it is. I, I get that. But it does, like Brad say, uh, take way too long to ship a box, 10 boxes to Amazon. Yeah. So yeah, it's a process. And so, again, not a rigging endorsement. I just wanted no. to let people know that this is one of those examples of when we say you got to keep your head on a swivel. Yeah. It's not something I'm enjoying doing. It's not something I even recommend. I'm just saying I'm I'm wary of the world changing, and I'm trying to keep a toe in waters of where I think commerce is going. Yes. Speaking of toes, uh, oh, I've got— Oh, God, where is this going? <laughs> I've got a question to ask you. This one comes in from Ryan Summers. Your, that was your transition? That's all I had. I no, had nothing better. I'm, I, I had have a question better. to ask you. Oh. <laughs> I got nothing. I just I just wanted to get to this next question because I, I mean, think to be it has fair, value. To be fair, in terms of quality content, I let us down a five-minute conversation about Akron, Ohio, so it's not like I have any room to... <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, listen, this comes in from Ryan Summers who says... Who do you think from the old newspaper strip days would have fully embraced the webcomics model had it been available to them? So we're not asking about like people who should have or would have made the transition during that crucial time in the late 90s, early 2000s. Right. We're talking about all of the those old newspaper uh, comic folks. Uh, which ones of them would have embraced webcomics? For example, would Watterson have merchandised Calvin and Hobbes 
if he had total control to make his own products? Would Family Circus have been on top us? Would we be flipping through Farside on Instagram? I ask you, David Joseph Kellett, which ones of those old syndicated cartoonists would have done swimmingly in today's webcomics atmosphere? Well, let's make this fun for ourselves. We could just say the last 20, 30 years of comics, but I think it's more fun to say the the 100 year span of newspaper comics. Everybody from the Yellow Kid, Cats and Jammer Kids, Gasoline Alley, all the way up to whatever the most recent launch was, you know, from from that might be a more fun conversation. And actually, I would like to tip off this conversation by by pitching my own pet theory, which is Mm -hmm. that. Some cartoonists would not have some cartoonists that we hold up as famous, as huge, as massive in their field yeah. would not have had a career if a very specific set of circumstances had not existed yeah. commercially and in around the art world. And I'll get I'll get to what I'm saying. So, for example, my pet theory is that had the hate Ashbury comic scene not existed, we would not know who Robert Crumb is. Right. He, he, he would not right. exist. He would still be working for Hallmark. Or, or something equivalent, like in advertising as an illustrator, mm-hmm. would have had a, a, a really short life, I think, probably. Uh, I think also true with Bill Watterson, had newspaper syndication not existed, I don't know that the world would know or have ever seen Calvin and Hobbes. Really? I don't know that he would have had a career had newspaper syndication not existed. Yeah. My own pet theory. Um, and so I think that's one angle to look at this. And then I mm-hmm. think it's also interesting to think back through the 100-year history of print newspaper comics. And think who were the people that really could have dove into it. Like, I don't think Watterson could have done it. But I will be honest, Schultz might have been able to do it. Because if you think of all the things early in his career that he was willing to do that had never been done before. Yeah, true. I'm going to take the shape of my comic strip and make it into a square yeah. so that people could stack it. They could make a box out of it. They could run it horizontally, right? Yes. He also took his characters and said, no, I'm just going to focus on kids. And I'm going to focus on it with this clear line style that a lot of people haven't really done in the U.S., in the post-war era, right? He did that. He also said, you know what? No adults. F it. And we're not seeing any adults ever. Right. And we're not going to even see the adults' influence on the life. Like, most comic strips in the U.S. were about that interplay between generations and between, you know, authority and kids. Yeah. He was like, no, this is just about kids. So I think there's a tiny bit of him that might have been able to go, oh, all right, this web thing. You know, if you plucked him out of 1950 and put him into... 1998. Yeah, uh, he might have been able to figure it out. Might have. I'm saying uh, mm-hmm. just because I think his personality was willing to do some experimentation, right? Yeah, and I think the other one you got to put on that list as an automatic is Mort Walker. I think he would have oh, absolutely swum in these waters, and I'll tell you why. Number one, take a look at all of the different things he had his hands in in terms of not only creating but co-creating. You know, look at all the comics that he had uh, his tentacles mm-hmm. reaching out, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to include Sam's strip, the the wonderfully named Boner's Ark. Uh, is... <laughs> Boner's Ark. Let's, let's pour one out for Boner's Ark. Yeah. Always the best comic strip title. <laughs> but, uh, but he had so many and so many partners and so many different things going on. You kind of get the idea that multitasking the way we have to do today would have come very naturally to uh, Mort Walker. I think I think in terms of him being an entrepreneur and somebody who could see the big picture, I really think you've got to give Mort Walker credit as being somebody who might have been uh, a a good person for web comics. I think you're you could also probably include the usual gang of idiots in the original editorial staff of Mad Magazine. Hmm. Those people, those people were taking some big swings in trying yeah. to uh, establish and uh, make work a new business model with Mad Magazine. Yeah. And I think they took some big swings and it it could have failed a thousand ways in those early years. Right. Without a doubt. And they definitely had a sort of entrepreneurial spirit that web comics require. So I think Mad I would include there. But let me ask you this, Brad. Let's yeah. go through some famous names. George Harriman. Do you think Crazy Cat could have worked as a, a oh. or he as an artist? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. That's a tough one because I love George Harriman. Uh, just I love his story. I I, there's, I love you know Crazy Cat was uh, was kind of brown groundbreaking. Uh, but was Crazy Cat the kind of comic that you could fall in love with uh, at at a glance? I, I like if I, you hadn't been forced to see it. Week right. to week, yeah, 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 day to and day. And by by being exposed to it, uh, 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 whether you wanted it or not, as part of your newspaper package, uh, people fell in love with it. I, I don't know that it would have gotten the same steam 
because uh, it's it's again speaking of comics that have uh, that ha- have a whole lot going on underneath the surface. Right. Uh, I don't know that that would have picked up as well uh, as it did in newspapers, where you just all you, you you get used to seeing it over and over and over again. Then finally, it wins you over, and now you eventually you're a fan. Uh, web comics work a lot differently than that. Uh, I don't know that Harriman would have uh, would have survived uh, under that. Okay, I'm going to throw out some some more. Yeah. This would be a fun way to do this. I'm just going to throw out names, and you're going to say yes or no. Okay, Walt Kelly. Uh, same answer almost, but maybe I give him, I give him maybe just a little bit of, a I change. also would say 50, He's 50, 50, 50. Yeah. I'd say 50, 50. Okay. Now let's try a different one. Uh, Jim Davis, Jim Davis. Uh, I, that's an, that's one. Everybody expects it to be a yes because he takes such, uh, you know, flack for being into merchandising and stuff. But before he got to merchandising, he had to get popular as a comic then again, he does a comic about cats, and it's hard to be more. <laughs> it's hard more to internet-y. find a group that's uh, that's yeah. more uh, willing to really back up a topic. So that's a yes. Yeah, I would I would give him a thousand percent a yes. Um, uh, Bloom County, Burke Breathed. Bloom County would have been a tougher one. Uh, Bloom, I'm gonna say uh, same fifty fifty I did for Walt Kelly, but I'm yeah, more on the agree probably not side. I agree with you. Okay, now let's do uh, Kathy Geis White. Kathy. Kathy Geiswhite is a yes. That's a Kathy, yes for me too. I think hundred yeah. percent she would have done well on the web. Yep. Because I, I, I also both in terms of her personality and in terms of her ability to write for a certain audience. You know, think yeah. about what she had to go through as kind of a trailblazer for women cartoonists uh, it, it, during that time. Yeah. Uh, if she could, if she could stand up to that, she could stand up to anything. <laughs> she's got what it takes. By the way, she's also on Instagram now. For those of you that like Kathy, uh, she, I, she's been posting uh, stand. Standalone quarantine comics uh, oh, really? on Instagram. Yeah. Um, all right. Now let's go with a uh, with another one. Uh, we got uh, Gasoline Alley. Would that have worked? Remember Gasoline Alley? Ass. No, Pass. I don't think. I don't think that would have. Cats, Cats and Jammer Kids. Cats and Jammer Kids. Cats and Jammer Kids. Oh man, it's Can't, going back a ways. When you, you get into the tens really and twenties, yeah, you have really got to be on your feet with that one. I. I don't have a strong feeling one way or another about Cats and Jammer Kids. Okay, what, what, Zippy, what the, Zippy the Pinhead. That? Zippy the Pinhead. Hey, listen, I'm surprised I made it through newspapers. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a freaking pass and then All another right. pass. Bill Amon with Foxtrot. Yeah, he would have been fine. He would have been fine. would have been just fine. It, agreed, it, agreed. Plus, he understands that he gets it. He's swimming in those waters as we speak. All right, uh, Wizard that's of That's a Id. no-brainer. Wizard, Wizard of Id. Of Id. Uh, Johnny Hart. Uh, was that? Yeah, Brant Parker and Johnny Hart, right? I believe so, yeah. Another one of those people that that Johnny Hart kind of is in the same category as Mort Walker. I got to say that Wizard of Iz had a pretty good chance at doing it for the really? same okay. reasons. Same reasons I gave for Mort Walker. Hagger the horrible. Or same Hag- thing. Hag- Hagger the horrible. Hagger. The- I never know how to pronounce that. Hagger the horrible. Dick. Yeah, is H- uh, Hagar. I think H- is oh, the, Hagar? if you okay. really if you really get into it. Hagar the horrible. B- 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 man, 50-50, maybe a little bit towards yes. Okay, Lynn Johnston. Lynn for Johnston. For worse. Oh man, see, you've got a really tender family strip that takes. You've got to really get into it. I gotta say, I have my doubts. Yeah, because it was another one of those storyline comics that really work well in newspapers when you're you, uh, uh, introduced to them over and over and over again. But uh, I don't know that it was written in such a way that would have taken root on the web. Yeah, I don't know, though. I think a younger Lynn Johnson in her 20s and 30s could have had a very successful Webtoons comic. Yeah? With a little bit of with a little bit of uh, a smooching. You know, I think she, she could have done well. Maybe, maybe. She did, she did relationships well. Okay, let's wrap it up here. Uh, Bill Keen, Family Circus. Family circus. Oh, God. You know, I think that sort of thing is tailor made for Instagram. Uh, (laughs) I think he would have had a shot. Yeah, I think he also I think Bill had enough entrepreneur in him that he would have been personally willing to be like, yeah, let's go down this route. By the way, also one of the funniest cartoonists in person. God rest his soul. He's he's passed now, but he was hilarious. He was literally one of the funniest people I've ever met. He was so funny. Like, Scott Kurtz once said this to me. He goes, you're much funnier than your comics. And I took that as a compliment, but I was fine, yeah. I was fine with it. Bill Keen was infinitely funnier than his comics. Wow. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, look up a speech if you can find one on YouTube. I don't know if they exist. Of one of his speeches, 
he was funny. He had he had bits that he would go to. He was great. Anyway, all right. Any ones you want to throw at me, Brad, for comic strip wise? Oh, let's see. Who would I throw at you? It might be interesting to throw a name like Pat Oliphant to you. Oh, Pat Oliphant. Did he ever do a comic strip? Or you're saying he was an editorial cartoonist? Yeah. Would Pat Oliphant? A brilliant editorial brilliant editorial cartoonist okay so uh, things to know about pat oliphant moved from australia to the u.s Mm -hmm. adopted an entirely different political sphere as his baseline for comics right in terms of like you know he grew up with australian politics now he's got to do american politics and then also totally recreated his style midstream in his career i think maybe pat oliphant could have done it he could have figured out a way to do political cartoons online yeah how By the about, way, that's a hard that's a hard road to hoe yeah. doing political cartoons online. That's oof. You're also engendering a lot of hate for yourself if you do it. Yes, you certainly are. Tom Wilson, creator of Ziggy. Oh, Ziggy. <laughs> looks like it's time for me to readjust all my table legs. <laughs> <laughs> Last one, Gary Trudeau. Uh wait, no, we gotta do Tom Wilson. Could Tom Wilson have done it? Oh, I, oh. Uh, I, I thought that was your answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like doing sample. Do I, you're always good at doing sample Ziggy joke, oh, like, uh, 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 you know, oh, all my belts seem to have gotten smaller over the weekend. <laughs> I'm Ziggy. I guess I offered my parrot a cracker, and, and the parrot said, Holly doesn't want a cracker. Hmm. Oh. See you tomorrow, everyone. I've been Ziggy. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know that Tom Wilson would have worked. I'm kind of surprised sometimes that Tom that Ziggy ever worked in the first place. I'm surprised he's there in the first I mean, place. I feel like Ch- Ziggy only existed in a world where 40% of the population worked as secretaries. I don't know that, that <laughs> something about that seems to have matched up. I don't know. <laughs> What an odd uh, line to connect uh, with dots there. Um, okay, last one then. Gary Trudeau from Drew- Doonesbury. Oh, oh, Gary Trudeau. Could he have made it go uh-huh. on web comics? I don't know. You know, he has enough of an entrepreneur streak. He has dallied in both Broadway and in TV. Mm-hmm. So he's he's independently comfortable with other mediums. I think yeah, I would give him a I'd give him a sixty forty chance at succeeding in web comics. Yeah, got a fight and chance. Okay, last one, Gary Larson, far oh, side. Oh, Gary, yeah, yeah. That, that that guy is one of the few people I think is unstoppable. Uh, his brain works in such a way that it, 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 when you see how he sets a joke up and how he sets up an idea for a comic. The, anybody whose brain works like that can figure out social media with no problem. Yeah, I think he would have had a career uh, very similar to Zach Wienersmith online. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not. It's not a one to one, but I think it would be very similar. All mm-hmm. right, well, let's jump into our next question, uh, Brad. That comes in over patreoncom slash lab from Stephen Barry, and Stephen writes, "Hi guys, I have an uncommon spelling of a common last name. Should I consider a pen name or a social media handle?" Mm social media handle other than my name to make it easier for people to search me. We've never had this question before, Brad. Uh, so some, as someone with a name like Guigar, which is a yeah. very unique, interesting last spelling of Guigar, right? Mm-hmm. G-U-I-G-A-R. Uh, yeah. What answer do you have for Steven? I got to tell you the truth about this, uh, Dave. When I first read this question, it sent a chill up my spine. Like okay. it, it really almost worried me. To a certain oh extent, because right. think think about what he's saying. He's willing to change his identity in exchange for social media points. It's it's it's, it's his name. It's who he is. He's willing to give all of that up to get an edge on search engine optimization and <laughs> and internet points. I it, I I don't know why, but this question bugs me. <laughs> Here's your answer, and, and I can, I can, I. And we might disagree about this because it's similar to a different topic that we've disagreed about in the past. I say no, keep your name because the percentage of people who are actually typing your name in letter by letter to discover you is infinitesimally small. Uh, people don't find you that way. They see you on social media and they click. They don't have to spell it out. They just click. And they see something they like, they see uh, somebody share a comic of yours, and they click, and now they're following you. They don't have to spell your name letter by letter by letter. Nobody's doing that. It's all click, click, click. 
So uh, keep your weird spelling last name. As, as Dave points out, uh, the, the standardized spelling of Geiger is G-E-I-G-E-R. I've been G-U-I-G-A-R. I, I would never consider changing my identity, uh, not only because I think it's 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 a place that I, I would be scared if we went as creators, but also because it's just not necessary. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know why you expected me to have a different answer than you. I actually think that uh, my answer is almost identical. And yeah. I, I actually think there is strength in having a uniquely spelled last name mm-hmm. for the concept of, uh, what is it, is, is, is the phrase a Google whack, Brad, when there's only one thing on Google that has uh, a search result? You oh, know what I mean? I've never heard of that. I know what you're talking about, uh, but I've never heard it called a I Google might have, whack. I might have the terminology wrong, but there's the idea that there are uniquely spelled or uniquely expressed things that there's only one thing that comes up on Google. When it, yeah. And when you find it, I think it's called a Google whack. Anyway, um, so Stephen, with your last name, if you were, if someone were to type in Stephen Cartoonist Barry, right, or Stephen Barry Cartoonist, mm-hmm. you might be very happy that you are so uniquely identified yeah. that they go right to your website and not to seven other websites from around the world of other Stephen Barrys that have a different kind of spelling or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, similarly sounding nice names or homonyms or whatever you want. What I'm getting at is I think maybe it has served Brad that he is not spelled the same way as Geiger Counter, that he's spelled right. G-U-I-G-A-R. Um, maybe it has uh, uh, somewhat benefited me that I have a, a somewhat unique last name that um, doesn't seem to come up very often. You know, uh, Kellett is two L's, and two T's. That's weird. Two I mean, I get a lot. Yeah, but a lot but of people assume right it's one L, one T. Like, yeah. why would you need two T's? What? That's weird. Yeah. Um, what I'm getting at is we all have weird. Uh, you know who would be great to bring into the chat on this is my my Polish great grandfather who absolutely Ellis Island his last name when he got to the U.S. <laughs> yeah, he would be like, "What the hell are you talking about? Of course, change your name. <laughs> you, uh, don't think twice. Don't what think was, twice. It, Become Smith. Why? Why make was, hard on self? Number um, one, I didn't know you had Polish ancestry as well as I did. But what was his original name? Do you know? Well, like a lot of people, I'm an American mutt. You know, we all yeah. have a little bit of something in us. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> the the original Polish last name? I yeah. actually forget at the moment. You put me on the spot oh, okay. and I forgot. So thank you very much for making me embarrassed on, <laughs> on behalf of my ancestors. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I So here, I'll tell you, uh, I'll get you out of trouble here. I'll give you something you can uh, disagree with me about. I'll tell you why I think that thought that you and I were going to disagree because a while back, you were very con- confident that I'd made a mistake by using evil hyphen ink.com as a URL. Yeah. Uh, and, and you had uh, uh, very good reasons that you backed up logically and so forth. But my, uh, my comeback to that was, yeah, but nobody's typing that in letter for letter. Very They're true. They're going to be clicking it any place they see it. They're going to click true. it. They don't have to spell it. Uh, so I, I thought maybe you and I would differ on that. Uh, no, I see what you mean. I, and also... As I said at the time when we were talking about evil-comic.com, mm-hmm. you have made an amazing career for yourself. And in fact, my thought, my angle on it has been provably false, provably false, that you did just fine with that uh, very unique URL. Yeah. And I think Stephen Barry will be very, will, oh, yeah. will be fine with his uh, unique uh, last name. Um, and it's also, Stephen, it's also worth noting, it's not that unique. It's not so weird that people won't remember it um and it's also it's unique in the sense that there are some stars like um uh eva longoria gets eva a lot and she's yeah. like no it's eva longoria and eventually what you might find Stephen, as your career goes on is that people come to it it becomes a, a line in the sand or a flag that you can plant that no i am Stephen barry yeah. b-a-r-r-i-e that's the way my last name is spelled yeah. and people will uh, what i'm getting at is it will become a special thing for you that actually becomes almost a mnemonic for people to remember who you are and remember your name and remember your spelling right and the bottom line is if you do a good comic if you do a comic that captures the attention of your intended audience they will learn how to spell your name <laughs> They'll make it their yes, job. Yes, to that's learn the most basic way to name. look at it. Yeah. All you got to do is is do your end of the deal and do a good comic. They'll figure your name out. Yeah, like think of Jeff Jacks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's that's. I think even Jeff would agree. That's not an easy first swing for most people. But once you learn it and once you come to love his work, you're like, now I know that name forever, and right. I know if I search that name, I'm going to find it online. Right, that kind uh, of thing. Take another. Uh, take a guest from earlier in the show. Did Ngozi sit there and say, you know, I'm I'm worried about people spelling my name? No. 
She did an amazing comic, and people figured out how to spell that's her a name. Re- that's another really good example. Yeah. The, the thing, the I would re- return us back to Brad's original point, which I think is the strongest one. Yeah. And I know this sounds like dad energy, but just be you. Yeah. Just be you. Be proud of who you are and uh, be proud of your family name and um, the world. Let the world come to you on that. You don't have to change yourself for the world. Well, speaking of names, I'm going to throw another name at you, Dave. Raj Solanki, who says, hey, Brad and Dave, after listening to your How to Start Your Own Webcomic episode a few weeks ago, I've finally taken your advice and I am doing it. Hey. Hey, by the way, congratulations, Raj. Here's a question I ran into. What are each of your processes for preparing a page slash panels for all of its different uses? Is it different when drawing traditional versus digital? What all do you consider when working on the page? Uh, Thanks for your constant inspiration and giving me the push I needed to just start. So, Dave, little background. I I dropped Raj a note and I said, "I'm, I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. It it seems like you're very broad. It's very broad topic. And he answered and his answer was equally broad. So I think what we're talking about is just maybe it's a good opportunity to do an overview of preparing like a page. Okay. Well, let's do this because it sounds like Raj is starting, which first of all, fantastic. Anytime Mm -hmm. this show can help someone start, that is wonderful. So congratulations, Raj. Second of all, since since he's in the process of starting, I would think it's worth going over basics of, of files. So yes. the way I look at the world, Raj, in terms of comic file preparation is there are two basic destinations. Mm-hmm. One is the printed page. One is a screen. And so let's talk about those two differentiations, right? So for anything that's going to be for the printed page, I want you to create a TIFF file. I, and by the way, I shouldn't say that I want you to do it. I'm just because I'll do, say what I do. Yeah. I create a TIFF file, and I create a TIFF file that's 300 DPI or higher. That's dots per inch. Um, 300 DPI or higher, that gives you a good resolution to print at. And then that file is always prepared either if it's all black and white as a grayscale or if it's um, for color as a CYMK. So that's for print. Mm -hmm. 300 DPI or higher, TIFF, CMYK. You can write that down very easily. Then if it's going to go to the web, it is either always a PNG, a JPEG, or a GIF. Very Mm -hmm. rarely a GIF, frankly, because of the color limitations. Yeah, let's be serious. Uh, And then the color uh, formatting is always going to be RGB, red, Mm -hmm. green, blue, for a screen, which is a different way of presenting color using three different, um, the three color system of RGB. Uh, the resolution on that is most commonly going to be 72 DPI. Although as we get into a 4k screen world and eventually into an 8k screen world, it will be Mm -hmm. interesting to see how that will update with time. But for now, uh, it is a, a 72 DPI image. Now for those, those are very clearly delineated by the pixel width um, versus a print image. So mm-hmm. if I produce a print, a print image and it's 300 DPI, I'm probably fine no matter how I, I mean, uh, there, uh, obviously there's going to be limitations, but with it, if it's, if, if I've created the image at 10 inches and I scan it at 300 DPI, I can do most anything I want to do with it. Right. Yeah. But for the web, the having agreed that it's going to be 72 DPI, uh, a thousand pixel wide image is markedly different than a 2000 pixel wide image. Mm-hmm. Right. And so for that, it's just a matter of platform specifics. Does your website want 1,000 pixel wide? Then you produce 1,000 pixel wide. Does Twitter want 1,500 pixels wide? Then you produce 1,500 Twitter wide. So we can get into the grass, get into the weeds on that. But Mm -hmm. uh, in general, for the web, PNG or JPEG, rarely a GIF. Um, And then uh, you want to do 72 DPI and an RGB format. That's the basics, Brad, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a really good way to start out. Now, if you're doing long form versus short form, because he also is talking about a page. So let's talk about the big picture. If you're doing long form, then you should take a little bit of time and do what Dave calls cool hunting and figure out what the size of your eventual book would be. Right. Yes, and because then, you're going to be working backwards. So yes, yes. Yes. And then build the page for that page size, mm-hmm. including margins around the edges and so forth. So you can, you know, you're not going right to the edge uh, unless you're doing a bleed, which is stuff that we can talk about much later. But figure out what your page size is. Now, if you're doing short form, that means you're probably doing a comic strip, right? Here's where I really want you to be careful and don't get trapped into the conceits of the newspaper comic strip like we just got done talking. Mm-hmm. Remember what I'm going to tell you. 
that is between 20 and 40 years out of date, depending on how you look at it. 20 from the uh, from the user standpoint, 40 from the cartoonist standpoint. Uh, so don't get yourself w- worked up into this whole idea of doing a four-panel strip or a three-panel strip. Think about it more in time in terms of doing a short form comic. Now, maybe that means doing four today and three tomorrow. Maybe mm-hmm. it means thinking of it in terms of a vertical scroll, the way most of the people are going to be re- they're going to be reading you on a phone. Mm-hmm. You should be prepared to do a vertical scroll. So don't get caught up in all of these conceits that are outdated for decades and decades. Right. Uh, instead, give yourself the freedom to think about it in terms of a vertical scroll that you can then assemble into either strips or cubes or however you're going to assemble them for the eventual print. Uh, you know, keep an eye on print and page, uh, but give yourself the freedom of that vertical scroll. That's going to do wonders for you. And in terms of panels going back to long form, again, like we said a while back, you're going to be preparing that long form comic, that page. You're going to be preparing that for a vertical scroll as well. You're going to do yourself a lot of favors if you keep those panels rectangular. In other words, no diagonal gutters, no no panels that that are trapezoids. Right. The only I'm, I'm convinced that the only reason people do that is they is that artists want to feel more arty about their pages because I got it. I, let's be honest about these diagonal gutters and trapezoid panels. Uh, it it, it, it oh, the only thing it does is made the make the artist feel snooty. A it doesn't do anything for the storytelling. Those weird angles along the edges you got to get illustration into doesn't do anything for the storytelling. B doesn't do anything for your mobile performance at all because now you got to have these trapezoids floating around on a vertical yep. scroll. C, uh, it, it, no, nobody has ever read a comic because it had great gutters. Forget <laughs> about it. That's my favorite <laughs> angle of yours. Like, no one reads a comic because it had great gutters. Uh, right. They want the story that's in those panels. Uh, so do yourself a favor. Rectangular panels. And your biggest... Uh, Difficulty there is going to be the odd horizontal panel, which is very difficult to get into a vertical scroll. I get that. Uh, But everything else is very, very doable. So plan your pages out with that in mind, too, that you're going to take and crop each one of those. And by the way, we get this question a, a, a frightening amount of time and, and it comes in through the Discord server and Patreon and so forth. People are like, how do you crop the panels for a vertical scroll? Uh, I, I I don't know how to communicate this to you. It's you're, I, whether you're making it more difficult than it is. You literally crop every panel individually. You crop panel one, save as, call that panel one. Crop panel two, save as, call that panel two. This is not difficult. <laughs> you're yeah. literally just going and doing them one by one. Now, if you have a whole stack of them on your desk that you got to go back to, yeah, that's daunting. And I see some people in Discord trying to figure out ways of doing that through Photoshop actions and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, listen, I've been there. I've, I've got a whole bunch of my old stuff I want to convert. Uh, and I'm I'm planning on doing that through uh, child labor uh, vis-a-vis my, uh, my children. <laughs> at some point, giving them a throwing them a few bucks to do that. I can't help you there, but in terms of preparing your stuff that you're doing day by day, uh, just go and crop each, each one of those panels individually, save mm-hmm. them all uh, independently, and 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 then you'll be ready to go when it comes time to post that vertical scroll or like we talked about before, the smartphone edition of your ebook. You'll have all that stuff ready to go. Yes. And I think as you're um, starting down this new and exciting path, Raj, you can also see that you don't have to reinvent the wheel for comics in the sense that one of the reasons why Marvel and DC and Image all ended up with that comic strip page that is taller than it is wide Mm -hmm. is with good basic physical reason, which is that a taller panel and a taller page allows for word balloons, uh, voice bubbles to float above a panel and mm-hmm. still have sufficient room for the comics. Yeah. So um, there is a reason why a lot of things netted out the way they did in comics. And it's sometimes it's not worth reinventing the wheel because you might actually find, oh, there's a reason why comics ended up being that shape. Yeah. So yeah. Um, to Brad's point, um, don't let the format or the 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 means of transmission overwhelm what you want to create. People come for the story, 
uh, not for the wrapper that the story is wrapped in. So um, to Brad's point, design your page so that it can be sliced and diced easily. Uh, and then, but remember that the each page has to have a satisfying um, uh, ending on it, so that um, whether it's a joke, whether it's a visual, whether it's a, a plot point or a character development, yes. something that when you get to the end of that update, it is satisfying. And then I think in general, uh, with all the the formatting things that we've suggested in the last couple minutes here, I think you are good to go, Raj. But more than anything else, congratulations and good luck with yeah. it. God, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's fun. And uh, I'm excited that you're getting going. Yeah, keep us in the loop. Let us know how you're doing. And on that note, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend Tom Wilson, the creator of Ziggy, who reminds <laughs> us that, oh, my pants are all flat plaid, and I don't know how to fit into this solid color world. Mm, I'm Ziggy. I don't know where that was going. I just wanted to include a Ziggy joke. Uh, Ziggy didn't wear pants. Oh, my God, that's right. Ziggy he, didn't wear pants. He was always, uh, he was always, uh... Off to the wind. Wait, wait, wait. Was he wearing a kind of a muumu thing? I need to. I need to Google yeah, him before we finish. Yeah, it was like a finish. big, like a, like a, like you know how sometimes uh, people wear a, a t-shirt that's too long and they will wear it for pajamas. That's how I always pictured Ziggy. Was wearing so Ziggy the too was long... in quarantine in 1974. He's just like <laughs> yeah, anticipating the was, pandemic. He was ahead of his time. <laughs> anyway, your hosts have been my pal Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my friend Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at SheldonComics.com and Drive at DriveComic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at TheWorldRecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and you may hear your review featured on a future episode. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like Ziggy. Even my easy chair isn't that easy. (laughs) Ziggy. You know you're in for a hard day when your mask won't fit over your bulbous nose. Oh, Ziggy, time to face quarantine. (laughs) What's different about our life? Absolutely nothing. (laughs) I still don't ask to leave the house. (laughs) I don't get asked to go anywhere. I'm just sitting here. Another day where I don't have to wear pants and I talk to my bird. So far, coronavirus is working out great for Ziggy. (laughs) 